This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons over on Patreon. You can help us continue to grow by joining for as little as $3 per month. Thanks for considering. When we think of disco, we often picture John Travolta dancing to the Bee Gees in Saturday Night Fever. But disco wasn't just about dancing the night away. It was also a movement that challenged societal norms and fought for equality. In today's episode, we'll explore the history of the disco movement, its cultural impact, and the role it played in empowering those in the margins of society at the time. During the 1970s in the United States, there was a time of great social transformation. This era was marked by significant advancements in civil rights, LGBTQ rights, and women's rights movements. The preceding decade had seen the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the March on Washington, and the Stonewall Inn riots, all of which shared a common goal, justice. As these movements began to converge and intersect, a new cultural phenomenon emerged, and that was the birth of disco. This new genre of music arose from the underground dance clubs of New York City. It was a creation of the Black, Latin A, and LGBTQ plus communities who found solace in the music and dancing that took place in these clubs. Disco music was characterized by its infectious rhythms, soaring vocals, and pulsing bass lines, and it quickly became a sensation. Music historians still debate the origins of disco, but several notable hits of the time included James Brown's Get Up, I Feel Like Being a Sex Machine, It was a disco classic and one of my personal favorites. Another example is Express Yourself by Charles Wright and the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band, a funky disco track that features Wright's distinctive vocals and a groovy beat. This song quickly became a popular dance tune and a classic of the disco era. Both released in 1970, these songs exemplified the early stages of the disco genre and the significant role that black and brown artists played in its development. But it was not only the music that was revolutionary. The disco clubs themselves were a radical departure from the norm. These clubs welcomed people of all races, genders, and sexual orientations, providing a place for those who had been excluded from mainstream society to gather and celebrate their identities. Disco represented more than just a musical genre. It was a symbol of acceptance and inclusivity, and its legacy still resonates today. During the early 1970s, disco music had gained mainstream attention and was steadily increasing in popularity. As a result, other artists began to take notice and soon followed suit. However, despite the genre's growth, disco was still considered a subculture. Notable hits such as the OJ's Love Train really marked a turning point for disco music at this time because it became the group's first and only number one record on the US pop chart. This song is widely regarded as a key factor in bringing disco to the masses. One of the most important developments during this period was the emergence of the DJ as the superstar. DJs like Frankie Knuckles and David Mancuso became household names, and their ability to create a sense of community and connection on the dance floor was unparalleled. They were the gatekeepers of the disco movement, curating the music and creating the atmosphere that defined the era. So while we see the disco music movement being driven by some of the most talented black and brown artists of the time, we also know that there's more to the story. Progress was being made for civil rights right alongside the beat of the music. It was in 1971 when the Supreme Court mandated that schools integrate through busing in the Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education case. Finally, the fight against school segregation was making headway, although resistance still did exist. The following year, Title IX and the Equal Employment Opportunity Act were both passed in 1972 which were significant steps in fighting against sex discrimination. In the same year, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its list of mental disorders, which was a significant step towards ending the medicalization of being LGBTQ+. Finally, being gay was no longer seen as a defect or an illness that required medical attention. 
This is a really big and important historical event for the LGBTQ plus community. And if you'd like to see a full episode on this to learn more, leave me a comment down below. These movements highlighted the need for a more inclusive approach to social justice and activism that recognized the intersections of people's identities and the various types of discrimination they could be facing all at the same time. It was the vibrant culture of disco music that allowed people from all these different movements to work together and advocate for change, making it a pivotal moment in history. It was 1974 and the disco scene was evolving. The once undisputed king of the dance floor was beginning to diversify and new subgenres like funk, soul, and jazz fusion were emerging. Cool and the Gang, Chic, and Earth, Wind, and Fire became synonymous with the disco sound, captivating a generation of young people who were searching for something new and exciting. This era also saw the rise of disco fashion. Clothes became a way to express oneself, and people adorned themselves with bright colors, glitter, and platform shoes. But it wasn't just the clothing that was changing, too. The way the people danced was also evolving. Two of the most iconic disco dances were the Hustle and the Electric Slide. The Hustle originated in the underground dance clubs of the Latin A communities in New York City in the early 1970s. It was later popularized by Van McCoy's hit song, The Hustle, in 1975. The dance involves a series of steps and turns that are performed with a partner, and it quickly became a crowd favorite. The Electric Slide, on the other hand, was created by Rick Silver in the 1970s and gained popularity in the 1980s. It was designed to be easy to learn and inclusive for dancers of all ages and skill levels. The dance involves a series of steps that are repeated to the rhythm of music, making it perfect for line dancing. The Electric Slide became a staple at weddings, parties, and other social gatherings, and it still remains popular to this day. By the mid to late 1970s, disco fever had taken over the country with hit songs like Dancing Queen by ABBA, Boogie Nights by Heat Wave, and Shake Your Booty by Casey and the Sunshine Band. Disco was no longer a subculture. It had become a phenomenon that transcended race, gender, and sexuality. Disco clubs sprang up across the country and people from all walks of life came together to dance the night away. In fact, by the end of the 1970s, there were an estimated 15,000 to 20,000 disco nightclubs in the U.S., many of them opening in suburban shopping centers, hotels, and restaurants. But disco's popularity wasn't just limited to the dance floor. It was a cultural force that influenced fashion, film, and more. The film Saturday Night Fever was released in 1977, and it catapulted disco culture into the mainstream bringing the music and its distinct style to a wider audience through film. I watched this movie for the research for this video and holy it's problematic. I won't say much, but I will say that it is racist, homophobic, and xenophobic. To me, it doesn't embody the true spirit of disco, and frankly, it's disappointed that the movie is so highly regarded by critics and audiences and even associated with disco in the first place. The movie completely ignores the true spirit of disco and its intersectional roots, particularly the influence of black and brown artists. And who the f eats pizza like that? As disco became more mainstream and commercialized in the late 1970s, it lost some of its original edge and began to distance itself from its initial audience. With countless producers attempting to replicate the music, disco started to blend together in an indistinguishable sound. But even as the movement lost some of its initial spark, there were still black and brown artists who continued to use disco's culture to challenge societal norms and push for equality. Like for example, the song You Make Me Feel Mighty Real by Sylvester. This song was written by James Wyrick and Sylvester himself in 1978. The lyrics spoke to the experience of LGBTQ plus people, particularly those who felt they couldn't be their true authentic selves in a heteronormative society. The song became an instant classic and is still played at LGBTQ plus events today. Disco was also a space for women to assert their power and independence. Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive, 
was released in 1978 and quickly became a feminist anthem. The lyrics speak to the experience of women who have overcome adversity and refuse to be held down by others. The song's message of empowerment and resilience continues to resonate with women and the LGBTQ community today. Other songs like Bad Girls by Donna Summer and Lady Marmalade by LaBelle celebrated female sexuality and desire. Similarly, Donna Summer's Last Dance became a symbol of liberation and self-expression. It was a song that celebrated life and living in the moment, something that resonated with many people who were marginalized in society. This song was featured in the 1978 movie, Thank God It's Friday, and won an Academy Award for Best Original Song. The lyrics encourage people to let go of their worries and enjoy the moment, something that was particularly resonant in the disco era. The Village People were another iconic group of the disco movement. They were known for their flamboyant costumes and catchy songs that celebrated the LGBTQ community. YMCA became a disco anthem and remains a staple at parties and events to this day. The movie The Wiz, which was released in 1978, was an important moment for representation of black people in popular culture. It featured an all-black cast including Michael Jackson and Diana Ross, and its soundtrack featured songs from some of the biggest names in disco like Donna Summer and Quincy Jones. Politically, societal norms and the fight for equality were also happening. We see this in 1978 when Harvey Milk became the first openly gay person elected to public office in California, which served as a really important milestone for the LGBTQ community and his activism inspired many generations to come. Let's travel back in time to the iconic Studio 54, the world-renowned nightclub located in the heart of Manhattan. This iconic venue played a significant role in shaping disco music and nightlife culture, which was rapidly growing in popularity during its heyday. Two people, Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager, ran the club which became famous for its celebrity clientele. However, as the disco movement became more commercialized, exclusive clubs like Studio 54, which catered to a select few, became the face of this exclusivity. Unfortunately, this led to the alienation of the original disco audience and left many of the artists who had helped create the movement behind. Studio 54 was infamous for its hedonistic atmosphere, with rampant drug use and sexual encounters happening on its balconies. The dance floor was even adorned with an image of the man in the moon, complete with an animated cocaine spoon. But the disco era wasn't all glitz and glamour. By the late 1970s, the disco backlash was in full swing, fueled by people who felt threatened by the cultural and social changes that it represented. Disco was seen as a threat to traditional masculinity and was targeted for its embrace of the LGBTQ culture. In addition, rock fans felt that disco was taking over the airwaves, and the media portrayed disco as a fad that was past its prime. Radio DJ Steve Dahl, who despised disco, used his platform to mock the genre and its fans with a segment called Disco Sucks. Dahl's anti-disco crusade caught the attention of the owner of the Chicago White Sox, who saw an opportunity to capitalize on the anti-disco sentiment by hosting a promotional event at the ballpark where Dahl would blow up a pile of disco records. What happened next was beyond anyone's expectations. The event drew more than 50,000 fans who brought their own disco records to add to the pile. As Dahl led the crowd in a chant of disco sucks, the records were blown up and chaos erupted. Fans stormed the field, setting fires and causing damage to the turf. The second game of the doubleheader had to be canceled due to safety concerns. The fallout from Disco Demolition Night was severe. Record companies distanced themselves from the genre and radio stations began phasing out disco music. The end of disco and the rise of the AIDS epidemic coincided, impacting dance culture in complex ways. Disco had emerged as a movement linked to the LGBTQ community, with its sounds and spaces providing a sense of freedom, joy, and sexual expression. However, the AIDS epidemic brought tremendous loss and suffering to the community, with many disco icons and fans falling victim to the disease. As the epidemic spread, a culture of fear and stigma emerged. 
affecting the dance scene and the wider culture. However, it is important to note that the response to the epidemic was not simply about repression and shame. Instead, many people in the dance community embraced sex positivity, promoted safer sex practices, and brought a new health awareness as a means of empowerment and liberation. And while the decline of disco is often associated with the onset of the epidemic, it's important to recognize that the genre and its legacy were never solely defined by sex or sexuality. Disco represented a celebration of life, love, and community for all. But even as disco began to fade from the mainstream, its legacy continued to be felt in music, fashion, and culture. The dance floor had become a space of liberation and self-expression, and disco had paved the way for future generations to embrace their identities and challenge societal norms. And while it's true that disco faced backlash and criticism during its peak in the 1970s, it's undeniable that its influence can still be felt today. Disco represented an important moment in music history. It was a time of intersectionality and cultural revolution, where music and dance brought together people from all walks of life. It challenged societal norms and fought for equality, creating a sense of community and liberation. And even though the disco fever is now in the past, its legacy lives on in the dance music that came after it. House music, which emerged in Chicago in the early 1980s, was heavily influenced by disco, and many of the DJs and producers who pioneered the genre were former disco enthusiasts. House music and its many subgenres would go on to shape the dance scene for decades to come, and disco's influence would be felt in everything from funk and soul to hip hop and pop music. What do you think about the impact of disco on society and its enduring legacy? We'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. So please share with us how disco has influenced you and the impact that you see it having on our society today. Thanks so much for watching and until the next time, friend.